All right, everybody. This is uh, Sean from the Southwest Florida Bourbon Society, and uh, really appreciate everyone being here today. We are uh, pleased to have Brett Elliott, the master distiller for Four Roses, to walk us through all of the OB recipes, um, as well as Tucker from Four Roses. Uh, let you guys take it away. All right. Thanks, Sean. And um, I'd like to thank you personally for sending me these samples and I'd like to thank you on behalf of probably everybody else on here. It's very generous of you to dip into your personal collection just to share some of the Four Roses uniqueness. Um, so I know probably most everyone on here, if you have the samples, you know what the four letter code is, but I thought it'd be a good idea just to walk through in case there's anyone who doesn't know. Um, so on each one of these bottles, you'll see it's O something, S something. These are all OB. So that second letter, that refers to the mash bill. You can see right here, the B mash bill is the higher rye mash bill. It's 35% rye, 6% uh, corn, 5% malted barley. Um, and all these are gonna be OB today. So this is part one, I think, of two different tastings. So we're going to taste through all the OB mash bills that are in combination with each of our five yeast strains. And I should mention also that it's four letter code. The second letter, as I mentioned, is the mash bill. The last letter is the yeast code. The first letter is always O, and there's a reason for that. It's actually because when we were part of Seagram's back prior to 2002, um, it actually going back even farther than that, back when Seagram's had five different distillers in the state of Kentucky, we all warehoused our barrels in the same location. So we needed a way to identify which um, distillery each one of these barrels originated from. So the O indicated that it came from the current Lawrenceburg distillery. The reason it was O is the original name of the Lawrenceburg distillery was Old Prentice. So... O indicates it came from Lawrenceburg, the original Old Prentice Distillery. Uh, the third letter is simple distillation. That also never changes because simple distillation is the kind of distillation you uh, you do to create straight bourbon whiskey, which is all we do. So first letter, third letter, never changes. Um, the last letter is the yeast strain. We have four different strains uh, that we'll be tasting through. Uh, v, K, O, Q, and F. Each one creates its own flavors through fermentation. Um, they all create alcohol, carbon dioxide, heat, just like all yeasts that are used in beverage alcohol production. But these have all been isolated from one another because each one of these creates more of certain flavor compounds. And even though these flavor compounds or congeners are only in there at a small percentage, they make a big difference in the final flavor profile, which we'll see tonight. I'll go through what each of these... Um, yeast strains, the kind of flavors they create as we go through each one of these recipes. So if you guys are ready to get started, I have put these in a special order. Um, if you're doing a tasting at home, and people ask me this all the time, you know, how how should we taste 10? They don't ask me all the time because a lot of people aren't lucky enough to have all 10 recipes. But when I am asked, and it is happening more often these days, uh, the best advice I always give, because this is what I always do, I always try to keep the F Q and O sandwiched, uh, or actually the K and the V sandwiched between those three. So I don't put a an O and a Q next to each other, an O and F or a, an F and a Q, just because I the way I envision these, and I hope you agree, like the K and the V are more um, like center mass of the total Four Roses flavor profile. Um, they're not overly fruity or overly floral or herbal. They are. Um, you know, the V is the delicate fruit, very typical of the Four Roses flavor. The K, it's a little bit spicy, typical of the Four Roses flavor. And those two recipes are the primary recipes in most all of our products. The F is very unique. It's kind of herbal, kind of minty. The O is very fruity. And the Q is floral, um, sometimes kind of candied at, at older ages. So those three, I think, are more um, are defined in a unique direction whereas the K and the V are, are more center mass. So I try to not put those two together to kind of create a, a roller coaster ride throughout the tasting. So if you guys are all right with this, I was thinking we'd start with the OBSF. And I'll tell you a little bit about that barrel. That is, let's see, it was selected by 
us versus you. And if anyone knows, I think maybe was that a Costco pick, Sean? Did you say? Yeah, it's sorry, I put it first, but it's us for you, which yeah was uh, available at a, I believe at Costco. Okay, it's an eleven-year, one-month barrel, fifty-two point eight percent ABV, so a little on the lower side, which isn't surprising because this is a first-year barrel. It's uh from warehouse R South seventy-seven one barrel M. And again, it's high rye. It's the FU strain, which I love the F strain because it's it's always a surprise. I, mean, I think all these can be a surprise, especially at these you know extra ages, eight, nine, ten, especially 10, 11, 12 years of age, because I can tell you what the or I can look and see what the recipe is and I can know kind of what it's supposed to taste like. But once you start getting out into these kinds of ages, the barrel has a whole lot to say about it. And I'll sometimes get K's, for example, they're supposed to be spicy and they end up being almost fruitier than V's in some cases or almost as fruity as O's. So I think it's part of the charm of the private barrel program is at a certain age, you know, the identities, I mean, each barrel is different. And at five years, you start to see that, six years, you start to see that. But the more time you put on a barrel, the more these personalities kind of separate from each other and you get different flavors, aromas from the barrels right next to each other. And you get characteristics from a particular recipe that maybe you wouldn't expect it's surprising. So that's part of what's so interesting about this. But in general, you get from the F, um, especially with this one, a lot of rye. And then you get that minty herbal note that to me is very interesting because it kind of, some of those notes, I think, uh, intermingle with some of the characteristics of rye. And for me, it's, it gives me a green impression. So when I taste the OBSF, um, at times, sometimes this one, I, you could almost fool me and tell me it was a rye whiskey because the way that the synergy between that FE strain and the, and the high rye mash bill work together. Figure we can open it up for uh, people that give their thoughts and I see uh, one comment, heck of a finish. It's funny you should say that. Like if I'm doing blending up limited editions or anything really, um, each one of these recipes is kind of like a tool in the tool chest and it has its, you know, like its uh, particular usefulness or it can you know, be used either you know, for spice, the obvious things like spice or fruit or whatever. But what I'm looking for, mouthfeel and finish, it's typically two recipes or two yeast strains that stand out. It's the F and the V. And the F for me really, it's just, it's very viscous, has a nice long finish. And I really like this. One. I know there are a lot of people that are all about the six tiers and higher tiers and higher proof. And I can enjoy those too. And there are always exceptions to <clears throat> well, like what I say I like. But in general, I'm, I lean more towards like a third tier like 108 proof barrel. And so I'm really enjoying this very like rounded and super easy sipping, rich OBSF. Do you have a certain kind of age range where you're finding from different tiers, they tend to go a little bit better? Um, and to some degree, um, one thing I can say for sure is Six tiers are going to hit that wall and start to become a little bit too oaky sooner than the lower tiers. Um, but it's almost batch to batch, barrel to barrel. But in general, I, you know, with the proof and the proof and the the quality are it's kind of a unique relationship that they have because you probably all know everybody has their own entry proof that really drives the final flavor of the product. So even in our warehouse, they're single story. They don't um, see a big variation in temperature from the first tier to the sixth tier. But we go in at 120 across the board. And if you go out far enough, especially like with these 9, 10, 11 years of age, you will start to see a difference in proof from the bottom to the top. And it's not just the proof. You're not just getting more ethanol from the top, but you're starting to see 
that the way it's extracting the different components from the wood will actually change just the way changing the entry proof will change the kinds of flavors that you get from the barrel. So it's, there's a lot more going on than just the higher tiers are getting higher in proof and the lower tiers are getting lower. And that's true, but you're also getting all of the flavor implications of that because of the different extraction implications that you get from that and reactions, subsequent reactions. <clears throat> All right, any other comments about the F before we move on to the high rise spicy recipe? I just have an overall question for you. So when you guys do uh, specifically, so like the single barrel bottled and bond that you know you see pretty much in every store, um, what recipe is that, or is that kind of determining on a bunch of different things? No, great question. It is always OBSV. Okay. Yeah, if it's if it's 100 proof and doesn't have a metallic label, it's always the OBS fee. Okay. And then for all the like the standard offering, is that just a blend of all the different mash or all the different recipes or? Yes. Four Roses bourbon is um, typically all 10, say 99% of the time it's all 10 recipes. Um, small batch is four recipes and small batch select is six. Okay. So OBSF. This, the one we just tasted, that is one of the dominant uh, components, the F um, used for in particular, is the dominant component in the small batch select. So you're going to find more F in that than any of our products. Uh, it's in Sporos' bourbon, but it's like less than 5%. It's a pretty small portion. See, so yeah, if I forget that, remind me to do that with each one of these. I'll tell you like what it's in and, you know, how it contributes to each one of these products. And like that one, the F to me is really the defining flavor characteristic of the select. Um, kind of that with the V, it's it's that V and K, but something about how the way the V and the F work together, they just create a really unique, um, rich type flavor. I, I just love how the F and the V work together. And the K is in there just kind of counterbalance to add some spice and different layers of complexity. So, oh, somebody have a question? Okay, on to the OBSK. This is a total wine pick. It's a third tier, so we're climbing up in proof a little bit here. This one's 57.3%. Uh, let's say nine years, seven months. It's warehouse K, east side, 63.3 barrel V. Uh, it was from back in November of 2020. Okay. I love the nose on that. And maybe a little bit of fruit, but this is a little more typical for an OBSK. Some nice rise, some delicate baking spice. And more of the same on the palate. That's really nice. You can taste that extra proof, but it's it's not hot. It's just a little more robust than maybe that last sample. A bit of a sweeter finish. Maybe not as rich, not as oily, but very bright. A little more high notes than I was getting off the last one. Thoughts, everyone? Red fruit, juicy red fruit. Surprised uh, we're not getting more out of Corey Cunningham, Mr. Uh, Four Roses himself. No, I, I particularly like this one. It's a classic K with a really nice spice on the end. Uh, really makes you think uh i don't know reminds me of like thanksgiving with the baking spices and and whatnot yeah i think that's a great example of obsk but i agree i'm getting fruit in that one too 
and again, you're, you know, we kind of simplify and we say F is herbal, K is spicy, but and these, these things are true, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're not going to find some of those notes, you know, bleeding over into the other ones. Um, again, like I said, especially when you start getting out to these ages, kind of all bets are off. You're going to get a lot of very unique flavor combinations that you, know, you can kind of predict, but oftentimes can't. And the OBSK, this one is uh, a decent proportion of the Four Roses bourbon, uh, but it's a big part of small batch. The Ks together are 70% of the total small batch profile. So and the O is the other one. So that's the balance between the fruit and the spice. Uh, you'll also find this <coughs> in a small percentage in the small batch select. But if you like this and you're looking for it in one of our standard products, you're going to get a lot of OBSK in the small batch. Uh, there was a question in the chat that asked from Ed. So what is the sweet spot on age and proof? For OBSK? Or I guess it's kind of it's kind of different on for each recipe for me personally. And I think everybody's palate's different. Um, like for OBSK, if I said to throw it out there, like if I'm looking at a bunch of barrels, sweet spot on that is typically between six and maybe 13, 14 years. Um, OESK, the low rye mash bill, seems like maybe I'm. I can stretch that to 14 to 16 years, the sweet spot. Um, if, and I'm, I like oak to a degree, but I'm always, I'm, I try to stay away from too much oak. Like we released a 20 year old for the gift shop. That was a rarity. That was a, a really rare example of a, an older bourbon that wasn't too oak, still had some vibrant legs to it and was still, you know, not just sort of an oak bomb. Um, so, you know, it, again, it's batch to batch, barrel to barrel. But in general, if I were saying OBSK, if I just had to pick an age, it'd probably be like 12, 13 years old. OESK, like maybe 14 or 15. If I had, you know, like one bottle I could drink for the rest of my life. Um, but oftentimes I'm in the mood for a, a seven year old OESK or a seven year old OBSK. It's just how much of, so what I'm looking for. So it's it's a really unsatisfying answer. And I've tried to answer this before. And I just I could talk about that all night, but um I can't tell you the proof, the sweet spot and proof more often than not for me is somewhere between 105 and 110 in most cases. Sorry. So if you say that when something got overly oaky, what do you tend to do with those those barrels? Do you blend those in with? some of the batch product? I just changed the format. Yes. Um, so what happens is, you know, we've got several several hundred thousand barrels in just warehousing, just sitting there waiting to be used. Uh, some that are of age, some that are just coming of age, and some that are past the age that they could even be used in small batch, small batch select or single barrel. And the way we manage all those is every time a batch comes becomes three years of age, <clears throat> I evaluate it. And based on basically its characteristics, I will reserve it for one of the primary products. And or even sometimes at this age, I'll it has characteristics that I can kind of tell, um, indicate that it may be worthy of a private selection or Know, seven years down the road, a potential candidate for limited edition. So I'll, I'll put some sort of in that bucket, that private selection or limited edition bucket. And usually it's it's barrels that it might be, you know, out of six tiers, three of the tiers go into the reservation for limited edition, three of them go into reservation for private selection. Now it doesn't necessarily mean they'll be used for that, but that's kind of the first vetting process. And then throughout blending, you know, week after week, looking at all these different batches again and again. Um, some of those batches might get moved out of that and other batches might get moved in. But these batches end up, if they end up becoming 10 years of age and they have not been used for the private selection program or the other products, then they're just sitting there potentially to be used for limited edition. 
And I'd say right now we probably have 25 batches, each one with anywhere from 20 to maybe 120 barrels sitting in it. That is really just the pool that I use every year to pull different barrels from and start working on test blends. And so I have a lot more reserved than we actually need. So sort of answer your question, inevitably there are batches that will become 20 and then 21 and 22 and that never get selected uh, or never work out in the test blends that I do that will end up starting to become too oaky. They're really not useful as single barrels and if I don't find a place to use them in a limited edition, those will just be used back in Four Roses bourbon. So it kind of shocks a lot of people to think, you know, the 80 proof bourbon that's, you know, you can find on every shelf. It's the one we sell the most of. You know, we bill it as a five and a half year old product. It's typically five and six year old barrels, but it could potentially have barrels in it that are way older than would anything we'd ever put in small batch or small batch select. But I, it's such a small percentage, you know, if we dump, you know, 5,000 barrels a year for four rows of bourbon, you know, 30 of those might be 18, 19, 22, 23 years old or whatever it may be. And I really just go through and clean house maybe once every year and a half and look at those old batches. And it's kind of a shame, but, you know, they're sitting there. They're really not useful for anything else. So that's where those end up. How many how many barrels go into that yellow label? Um, we so we have huge tanks that we really never let run in empty. So we're filling those up, and so if we dump, we could dump four or five hundred barrels at a time, and what is in those tanks can either go onto a tanker truck and be shipped to Scotland or Japan. Uh -oh. bottling here it's we bottle it for the u.s market if it goes on a tanker um then it just goes to scotland where they they bottle it for the um, eu market or japan for the japanese market yeah it's typically typical dump would be you know four to five hundred barrels okay anyone so you guys want to move any, any other questions? I guess I do have a question. So when you get into some of those older age products, or even, you know, when you look at the the 10 to 15, the 10 to 15 year old products, do you notice any differences between the barrels um, when you were the master distiller? Or how much of a difference do you see between your barrels and the previous master distiller? Uh, I guess the same would be as I started, or I took over in 2015, so the, the scene would have been right there, like fall production of 2015. And I haven't seen any difference between those. Um, and it's no surprise, like when I took over, you know, I've had that question a lot, like, were you nervous about that? Were you, you know, maintain the quality? And that was, a, of course, it was in my mind, but that was sort of the least of my concerns, um, just because we've got you know, I'd worked in alongside Jim and with everyone there for 10 years prior to that. And everybody, we have it down pretty much to a science. And, you know, it's a big team, a lot of people working together. And so really my biggest worry, and it's funny looking back now, but was having to stand in front of big crowds and talk. Like that was the first thing that went through my mind because they didn't ask me. They just told me I was going to be the master distiller. And I was like, Okay. You'll find out that I, I don't know how to talk in front of crowds and I freak out, but we'll let this ride till that happens. Um, fortunately, I don't mind talking in front of crowds, it turns out, if I know what I'm talking about. But so, yeah, so like Foros Bourbon, that transitioned. So we're now using 2017 and 18 liquid for that. So that's been stuff that was distilled in 2015 or later, everything in small batch. Small batch select was distilled after that. So, but I haven't, the older stuff, I guess it's a good point. I haven't looked at that yet because I haven't looked at anything. Um, well, some of it's been reserved, but none of that stuff will even be eligible for limited edition until it's at least 10 years old. All 
All right, you guys ready to move on to the OBSQ? So this one, the only place you're going to find this outside of Sean's collection is uh, in Four Roses Bourbon. And this one's very unique. Um, like when we first started the program, the private barrel program, the only cues we had, the oldest ones we had were like five and six years old because it's used in Foros Bourbon, just sort of a small percentage, kind of as a top note, just to add complexity and that that bright, clean floral aroma and some flavor. Um, <clears throat> so I'd only tasted five and six year old cues in any substantial amount. So I was like, well, you know, 10 recipes, that's great. Q is probably not going to be very popular because it's kind of one dimensional. What's interesting though, is once we start to let these age out, once they start hitting eight, nine, 10 years of age, you start getting more of that barrel characteristic. I think some of those one dimensional floral notes, they start to come down as the barrel components, uh, you know, the caramels, the vanillas, and the sweet notes, as they start to rise and they meet in a certain place and they create just some really fantastic candied like flavors and aromas. So I really have um, begun to love the, or I've been loving the cues for a long time now, but it's funny looking back that when we were talking about the program, I was like all 10, even the cues. <laughs> I didn't know, but it's part of what makes, makes it so interesting. So cheers, OBSQ. And I'll look up the details on that one. Sorry, I skipped that part. So this is, this one comes all the way from Hawaii. The Hawaii Whiskey Mafia chose this one. It's got some age on it, 11 years, two months, and it's a sixth tier, 63%. Uh, so this is probably the highest ABV of any, any that we're going to taste today. Yes, it is. And so, you know, I say, in most cases, my favorite tiers are third tiers, 108, 110 proof. But this one's really hitting the spot. You know, something about those explosive candy Q flavors and then boost that up with very, very high ABV. It really is working well. I was going to say, it's like Pop Rocks in my mouth right now. Yeah, that's fantastic. That's incredible. I should have kept that one back in the bunker. <laughs> you got any more? <laughs> and I bet Hawaii hasn't selected a whole lot of barrels. They chose well with that one. I know my brother-in-law is on here, and he was the one that helped get it, but he might be uh, have his hands full with his his baby boy, so... But that's wow. You guys want to taste that one again? <laughs> I'm tempted to. I'm afterwards. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Only got a little bit left of that. That's one. all you got left. That's so good. It what is, was that selected? What was the what was the year on that? Uh, May 2022. Okay. It may be a dumb question, but I can't find this anywhere. That's a. The best um, one so far. That's really good. Yeah. yeah, that one's long gone. All right, Sean, I'm coming over to get a refill. What's going on, brother? <laughs> <laughs> oh, trust me, after once, like, I got back to Florida and then I looked at the bottle and I was like, um, well, Damn. I'm planning on doing this event, but if there's any more laying around somewhere, please. If I find them, I'll let you know. We have a group of uh, three of us out there in Hawaii, uh, and Chris was supposed to be here too, who helped as well, and uh, he got called into a to a work case out there in Hawaii. So, well, all the more reason to thank you for sending this out, sharing. But so a little more on the Hawaii Mis whiskey mafia. There's like a group of restaurants and stores that all get together and get to do some barrel selections and. I think this was their fourth selection with you guys. Well, 
Tell them good job. It's a great barrel. See, I love it when I contradict myself. How I probably spent five minutes talking about how I like 108 proof bourbon. And yeah, I think that's my favorite so far. No, it's, it definitely is. And it's way above uh, 108. I don't think it tastes overly proof, though. It's, no, it's just a really well with flavor. It's just explosive flavor and bright and just delicious. And kind of candy, like, again, if this were the same batch at five and six years of age, it would smell great. It would be a great top note, but it's not, really not a lot of layers of complexity at that age. But, man, when the oak starts to rise and the vanillas, the caramels, everything else that you get from the barrel, I, okay, I'm going to have another little sip. It really, <laughs> it's, uh, it's remarkable. Great. Now everyone's going to continue to look for tier six and yeah. it's happening before your very eyes. I'm changing my mind. I changed my answer. I like six tiers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you guys ready to move on to OBSV? So this one, as I mentioned, this is the recipe for the standard single barrel, which was Chosen as the recipe for single barrel long before my time, Jim did that, and I couldn't agree more with his decision. I think this is like the most versatile all around, especially at seven and eight years of age, the perfect recipe to have chosen for single barrel. So this one is, sorry, I keep referring to my phone here. I've got the information here. This is... Uh, is that Ohio Liquor Control? Yes. Selection. Okay, it's nine years, seven months. It's the second tier, 56%. Uh, S Warehouse, North Side, break 86, tier two, barrel W. Is this O or V? What are we on? I'm sorry, this is OBSV. Got it. Okay. And for some reason, you'd think OBSK would be like this. But for me, OBSV is the one that, well, the V and the F too, both, but the, the rye really seems to shine through very well this particular yeast strain. So I typically get that as a dominant note on, the, on my nose. And the palate. What's the proof on that one? 56%. So 112? 112. And that is a very typical OBSC. If you're familiar with the standard single barrel, it's got that same characteristic OBSV flavor, just a little bit more age. That's really good. Thoughts? That one's got a lot of your your typical bourbon characteristics to it, like the typical big flavors, the dark chocolates, the caramels, stuff like that. But then it punches you in the back of the throat with some of the rye spice at the end. Of, really enjoyable. Yeah, I agree. I think that that one in the K, they're the more typical bourbon flavors. That's why I kind of refer to them as the center mass. Um, Yes. And rye. That, I'm getting a lot of rye on that one. Both nose and palate and finish. I smell so that. Really <clears throat> I smell that pear note on the nose. Yeah, I get a lot of pear and apricot with V's a lot. The older the V's get, I get the more apricot I get. That seems to really evolve in a lot of barrels, a lot of V barrels. Any other comments on the OBSV? Oh, and also this is at a pretty high percentage in small batch select, the Vs. So the V and the F, those are the two dominant yeast strains in select, and then K is the more minor. 
would you say you produce more OBSV than any recipe? Because absolutely, uh huh, a whole lot more. Because it's a significant portion of used to be more OESV, um, because we still use more OESV in four roses bourbon than OBSV, but with single barrel being as popular as it is and small batch select, OBSV is now definitely the dominant recipe in our production schedule. <clears throat> so what's what's made the least out of all the recipes? Q. Well, it's a shame because I think that's everyone's favorite so far. That is a shame, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And the good thing about the cues is, so if I'm looking at three years of age and I'm looking at maybe in a particular season, eight batches of OBSQ, you know, that's, we only need probably six tiers at most to be reserved either for limited edition or um, private selection. So that's a lot of barrels that I can really hand select the very best of because there aren't any other demands other than four roses bourbon. So it's either four roses bourbon. So a Q, if it's when it comes to the crossroads, it's either four roses bourbon or it's private selection. So there's no other place for it to go. Can you talk about the how the single barrel selection process works like with you guys? I know I think I've seen some videos and, and of the such, but um is that they're trying one of each barrel kind of hand selected by you and then narrow uh, it down? Yeah. So um, it is kind of like I was saying at three years of age, everything gets kind of allocated, a rough allocation for a specific product. So for the actual private barrel um, barrels, the ones that are earmarked for that, you know, those we don't even roll those out until they're, until they're eight. And we will bottle them up until they're, or let people select them up until they're 12 years, 12 months, 12 years, 11 months. And um, so if any of you have, are familiar, very familiar with the program, you probably know Mandy. Mandy will call me up and she'll say, hey, we're running short on OBSQ, let's say. So I've got, you know, these different batches just waiting the wings um, to bring into the program. So when she does that, I'll look at the next batch and stuff in the rotation. And I'd already looked at that batch again, like when it was six years of age. So I, to make sure that it's still going to be, if if it's not the right quality, then I'll swap out something else. But if it, in most cases, it's aging well. Um, if I do a good job at three years of age, um, evaluating and allocating. So it's sitting there. So the first step is just sampling or having every barrel in that batch sampled or every barrel that, that could be rolled out for a customer sample. So at that point, get them in the lab. And this is what takes up truly probably, I couldn't put a percentage on it, but approving barrels for private selections and hundred proof single barrel is it's happening almost every day of the week. And it's anywhere from 50 to hundred barrels, each one of those days that I'm looking at them. So, so let's go back to, it's just private selection. She'll maybe send two or three tiers, 22, 23 barrels per tier of the OBSQ samples. And at that point, and I've tasted the batch, you know, I know it's great. Now it's just about approving individual barrels. So we'll set those up in the lab, cut them to 20%, and basically just smell through them all. I might taste one or two from each tier if there's any question at all. But at that point, the easiest, most efficient way and the only reasonable way I couldn't taste through every one of those every day like that. Um, but actually smelling at that level is the best way to do it. Start smelling them. You actually, I go through it once very slowly and, you know, make any notes. I'll go through it again and I'll go fast. And I find that actually going through fast the second time seems to be more effective because my nose kind of goes numb. And if there's an outlier, good, bad, or whatever, it seems to stick out more. And so through that process, you know, there are always a couple, you know, whether it's standard single barrel or private selection that get kicked out. They'll just be used for four rows of bourbon, 
for whatever reason. It's not like there's ever anything that's undrinkable, but it's just a little bit outside the range. And I do allow a larger range within the private barrel selections because someone else is going to select it. So, but for the single barrel standard hundred proof, um, you know, I'm kind of selecting for the consumer. People expect a little more consistency. The private barrel program let a lot more through. Like, there's a lot more variety, and that's exactly it. you. You show up. Mandy will have hopefully up, hopefully all ten recipes sitting there in barrels. Um, got a nice tasting table. She's got you know, tasting mats out. Um, you go through and we'll thief from every single barrel into your glass. And if you have a group, of, say five people sitting there, you all taste through all 10 recipes, make notes. And typically how we do it is we vote. Um, there are plenty of times where maybe you know, one person's vote counts more because maybe they own the liquor store, or whatever the account is. But in most cases, it's pretty democratic. Like um, we'll tell everybody to pick their top three and then everybody will raise their hand when we go through all 10. And then things are working out well, there's one clear winner. In most cases, there's a two or three way tie. And then we'll sometimes go to a second round where we'll say, okay, well, if it's just these three, everybody sample them again or sample them blindly and revote just looking at you know these three or these two and kind of narrow it down that way. And then once that's decided, um, it's usually, you know, pretty quick now, you know, within a month or two, it's bottled, all non-chill filtered, proof right there on the line, proof is printed on the label and get the side label and you get the barrel or get the bottle. The bottles. I, were there some questions I, as I was talking, I saw a few, but I didn't read them. Um, <clears throat> the first one I see is which mash bill is most selected by customers by Ed? Uh, you know, I actually had someone tally that up for me about six months ago because I was curious and I can't remember what the result was. And what's interesting is it kind of, it kind of goes in spurts. Like we might have a certain run of a certain recipe that's just phenomenal. And that one gets picked disproportionately higher than the other ones. And then you know, the next six month period, it might be another recipe. So it's not, it's definitely not lopsided. It it fluctuates, but it's, it's relatively even between the 10 recipes. But honestly, I couldn't tell you offhand, which, which one does or is selected the most. For the bottles in your gift store, uh, th I know, so you pick those, but where on the, I guess, level of, are those like exceptionally good bottles or barrels, I suppose, or how does that work? That's interesting. So let's back up to when I was saying I go through all of those samples and just smell them for approval. Typically, like I'll know, depending on how much we're doing in the gift shop, that I need to earmark three or four of those barrels from each tier when I'm going through. This is where it gets kind of weird because I might earmark, say, three barrels from an OBSQ, OBSQ tier. And that's all I know. I've earmarked those. Then when we're actually bottling and bottling uh, samples for, or barrels for customers and Mandy is looking at, or marketing is letting Mandy know how many they need for the visitor center. They will come to her and they'll be like, we're, we need, you know, we haven't done OBSV, OBSQ, and OBSO for a while. So if when they're pulling from that tier, if they need that OBSQ, they might use my barrels. If they don't need those OBSQs, those OBSQs that I said that I earmarked might be rolled out for customers and they might get them. So I actually allocate more barrels for the gift shop that ever end up in the gift shop. And when I allocate a barrel for the gift shop, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to go to the gift shop. It's not a perfect system, um, but the, you know, I really, there's really no better way to do it. And I've racked my brain and thought and thought and thought. Um, was there have been plenty of times where I've been in the barrel selection, I've tasted the sample like a good example is that OBSQ. I can taste that. I'm like, you know, man, 
if I had spent a lot of time with that sample, that would have been a VC pick for sure. But, you know, I, there's really no mechanism to do that. And even if there were, it's like, yeah, it just wouldn't be logistically feasible. So I earmark barrels based on the criteria that it is, and it, it can be different criteria, kind of same criteria, like when I actually earmark a batch for private selection, it's either just very correct to code, like it's, this really is a great example of OBSQ, or it could be, this is really unique, and I think people would enjoy this, um, or this is this is aging very well. This is, wow, this is 10 years old. And it's, it's, it's getting better even than it was last year and showing no signs of coming too oaky. It's still vibrant. You know, it could be, there's really no set criteria when it comes to private selections or limited editions. So I kind of use that same criteria when I'm looking at those barrels and I'm just, when I'm approving them, be like, wow, that, that's a good example of this or that one's got a vibrant nose or that one's kind of unique or I, I like something about that. And so I'll just earmark those. And again, so anything that's used for the VC is one that I've been that I've earmarked, but just because I earmark it doesn't necessarily every time mean that it's going to be used. So it's less best of the best and more just your personality, I guess, showing through. Because as you were talking about earlier with the or Corey Todd, I think asked the question of uh, the difference between you and Jim Rutledge or the scene. And the only place I can taste that is the, the limited editions, and it's more personality-wise as it goes through that transition between you and him. Is that kind of what the gift shop is, or you would think? I guess, I mean, it's a little, yeah, it's it's definitely the ones that I earmark that I like that are kind of have the personality that I'm looking for. So that's definitely reflected in that. But I think a lot of people think that I'm, I do like my own barrel selection. I'm like, this one's going to the gift shop for sure. And I'm tasting it. And I wish you could be like that. I really do, because... <laughs> But the fact is we do a lot of, we're doing a lot more VC picks now than, than we have in the past. And if if our locations were together, I would be able to do it that way. Because the days that they went, so they're like, okay, we're bottling private selection and we're going to be pulling a bunch of um, barrels from this rick and we need, you know, OBSQ and this is what we're pulling right now. And I would just, pull up a chair and be like, okay, which ones aren't reserved for customers? And I'll taste them and be like, send this in the gift shop, this in the gift shop. <laughs> so, but at the same time, I don't want to intentionally like go in there and do it before the gift shop and be like, I've, you know, and it, there's so many good ones. It really wouldn't matter. But the perception, if I went out and sampled and said, I took all the best for the gift shop, you know, that wouldn't, you know, that, that wouldn't play well. But um, that wouldn't be the case. I mean, there's so many good ones, so many differences. It would just be, I selected the ones that were really spoke to me, that really matched my my palate. The same is probably true of, you know, some that I kick out. There are probably some that people would be like, man, that was, why was that one rejected? That that really had something special. But you ready to taste OBSO? Sounds like uh, I think I saw some comments. I think maybe a few people already have. <laughs> I don't blame you. But a, a pretty funny story. That's kind of a geeky story, but to, it's a pretty big deal for me. I was doing a barrel selection one time, and one of the criteria that I will kick a barrel out for, or one of the characteristics, is if it's kind of leathery. Um, and a lot of people love that leathery note, and I kind of enjoy it too. It's not. It's not bad. Um, but it's kind of outside what you'd expect from Four Roses. Like if you bought it, I definitely would not let like a standard single barrel get through with a leathery note because that's not the profile that you're you're buying when you buy a single barrel. But I actually missed in that process for private selection, there was a barrel that got through that did have a leathery note. It was pretty minor, but um, I was doing the barrel selection and we were tasting through them and I got to that sample and I was like, Oh man, I missed that in the lab. And that's definitely got a leather note that's not, you know, four roses note that you know people don't expect. And sure enough, the the people that are selecting the barrels loved it. And they picked up on it immediately. Like, wow, this isn't very four roses. Like this is 
has a leathery note and you know, it's, wow, it's a little bit smoky. And I was like, well, I like it too. And if they like it, then no harm done. But I definitely miss that in the, the screening process. Anyway, the OBSO, it is from quicker, nine years, 11 months old, 53.2% ABV first tier. And I will say, when you're talking about sweet spots and ages, OBSO, even more so to me, I really enjoy those on low tiers. Something about the, the roundness of the fruit, the, um, the richness, the way, the synergy it gets with some of those low tier caramel and vanillas. Um, so I'm really excited about this one. Really dances on the tongue, similar to like the how the Q and K were. Mm. Yeah. Sean, do y'all have a barrel pick um, in the works with Four Roses? I, 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 I wish we, I could say that we do, but nothing in the works yet. But uh, I mean, if they ever call us up to the big leagues, we're, we're not going to say no. Brian, I think we lost your audio. No pressure at all, right, Sean? <laughs> Yeah, I don't think we're, I think that's something we got to work on. I don't think we're getting Brent right now. Can you hear me? There we go. Now we okay. can. So, any comments on that OBSO? It's pretty incredible, if you ask me. That that's the most unfour roses, four roses I've ever had. That's delicious. I really enjoy that. That's a good pick, too. Pretty typical OBSO. And it's more vibrant. Like, it's not hot, but it's more vibrant on my palate than the proof would suggest. It still has that fruit, but that rye comes through and really kind of gives you that, that vibrant, tingly rye sensation on the tongue. Like, it's, it's got some legs to it. What did I say the age on that was? Uh, nine years, 11 months. Okay. That's honestly my second favorite of the group behind the OS, OBSF. I don't know why those two are just really hitting right for me tonight. Starting to get people's rankings. Couple with the OBSF is number one. Couple OBSQs. SQ over here. I like the V. Also, before I get, uh, if we could all wish uh, Dr. Miller, who's uh, part of this, a happy birthday today. Happy, happy birthday, birthday, dude. Thanks, guys. Happy birthday. Appreciate it. Figured you didn't want anything more than to uh, spend your birthday with us, right? No. What else would I rather do? <laughs> it was fun. It was either this or, or uh, a business meeting, so I'll take this any day. Oh, yeah. Good choice. I was going to rank top to bottom, I'd say F-O-Q-K-V, but there's really not a large margin of difference between them. They're all pretty solid. I was going to say, it's got to be a pretty difficult process when people come in and splitting hairs on, or like, are people pretty good at picking out recipes or it's... I'm typically impressed, like surprised in a good way. Um, usually it's, it used to be people would be surprised that there were differences. Now everyone is to the level that they're like, and it can be good or bad. They can walk in. They're like, I know what I like. This is the flavor profile. And really to combat that Mandy covers all the barrel heads. So no one knows what recipe they're looking at, but people, a lot of people are very confident in their palates. Like there's like, they taste room like. This is the one I like. You know, this one will do if the group feels that way. But, you know, this one speaks to me because they articulate what they like about it. Um, 
And that's something you didn't see like 10 years ago, 10 years ago. And we get a lot of people that like you guys that are familiar with the 10 recipes and maybe done barrel selections before and are again, super confident in what they're, what they're tasting. But, and you get a lot of people too, still that might be their first pick and their first trip to four roses. Don't know about the 10 recipes. And it's great to watch them too, because even though they can articulate it, they know what they like. And I always try to stress that with anyone because it can be intimidating, especially since you get a lot of, uh, I guess, marketing descriptors and, you know, reviews that are awfully verbose and poetic. And that can be pretty intimidating when, you know, you're just a guy starting out bourbon. You're like, all I know is I like this one. You know, I like this one a little less. It all tastes like bourbon. It's all good, but I'm not getting persimmon or cracked corn or, you know, all whatever, you know, they're not seeing that it can be kind of intimidating. So in selection or when I'm out just talking to people, like it doesn't really matter. It's we use that just for communication. And I personally don't use, I don't get too flower with my language. Sometimes I have to, when I'm writing, you know, tasting notes for something, but for the most part, it's like, you know what you like, you don't have to have anybody tell you, or you don't have to articulate it in a poem to to prove that you like it you know what you like so that's the cool part about it is just seeing people discover that and at any level it's it's fun to watch any drop down drag out fights over a certain recipe over another uh i've never seen any but i think mandy's been involved in somewhere you know because yeah you, know, you wait to get a barrel for a long time you're in there with you know, it's five of your friends that you, you know, everybody respects each other's palates, but one guy falls in love with this barrel and this, this girl falls in love with that barrel and you're only walking away with one, you know, I don't think it's ever gotten violent or, or mean, but you know, people get pretty passionate about it. And I understand that. <laughs> I'd, I'd worry if we did one, some of the arguments that would go on behind the scenes, because I've seen it before. Oh, man, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> Don't call me out so so brazenly there. <laughs> you know, we were talking you about Corey. <laughs> Which, you talk, Corey Cunningham or me, Corey? Oh, uh, it's, me, it's, it's me, Todd. Sorry. <laughs> 100%. So are you guys, have you submitted um, to get a barrel? I I had uh, probably about a month ago, still hoping to cure back. Okay. The fact that you haven't heard anything doesn't mean anything. They haven't made decisions for, is it a charity barrel? Yes. Okay. Yeah. None of that's been decided yet. So no trying news help, is not bad news. Trying to help. Uh, obviously, we had that hurricane from last year and it impacted our area probably more than anyone and hoping uh anything that we can do and i know we've been doing some fundraising on that end but we're good why well, i, I hope you guys get a barrel i know if you, you do let me know that. i'd like to join you guys if i can well uh, we, can, be we can do this in person with all 10 recipes there we go and fight about it <laughs> you guys can fight man <laughs> and i will mediate <laughs> there we go <laughs> um any other questions comments i mean i know we've we've done five of the ten we have another night uh we're lucky enough to have abby join us uh here on april 20th to try all the e-recipes um nice. no tier sixes or anything like that in there but uh still some really good good barrel selections from uh i think most of them are local except for one of your visitor center selections Okay. Which I know is, uh, I think a group of us got when we were there doing a barrel selection, uh, what, almost two years ago? Yeah. So, and that was a personal favorite I know of uh, Mr. Cunningham down there amongst others. So, and I think that's the last time that, uh, that we saw you was when we were there for that. Was that, that was post COVID, right? Yeah. Uh, yes. Okay. But uh, what recipe was? Which one was it you all picked? 
I, no, so so we didn't do a selection. We we were just at the visitor center and got to meet you. Okay, you didn't get to a pick while you're here. No, but uh, we were lucky enough. It was a visitor center, and I think it was a the OESF, which was a ten year yeah. five month. That was I think some okay, very big favorite of everybody. And I th I think Corey was lucky enough to win a limited edition from the last virtual event we did. I did. Brent signed it. Thank you very much. I still You're haven't welcome. opened it. I don't want. I don't want to open it yet. <laughs> The 2022? It's a 2020. I'm, oh, okay. It's been, it's been a minute, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, when you do crack it, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, I've, I've had the 2020, and it's, uh, honestly, it's one of my favorite recipes, or one of my favorite LEs that I've had. I like it over the 2019 that everyone really goes crazy over. and so. Have you had the 2022? I have not had the 2022 yet. Is that a good one? Yeah. Man, yeah. <laughs> the more, like, I'm always reluctant. Every time we release one of these, you're like, how's it rank with the other ones? And I'm always like, I, it's going to take some time. You know, it's hard to really pick one anyway. But to pick one, you know, yeah, I've had the 1900 times. I've had the 20 hundred times now. But, you know, when the first 22 just first came out, you know, I'd had it a handful of times. Now I've had it a bunch, and the more I have, the more I'm really – it's rising in the ranks. It's it's rising to the top. Same thing happened with the 2020. Like, when it first came out, I was like, yeah, I think I like the 2019 more. I think I, I might prefer the 2020 over it now. And the 2022, it's a little oakier. So, again, after me saying, you know, I'm a little bit leery of a whole lot of oak, it's definitely got more oak. It's 20% of 20-year-old. and uh, Man, something about, I mean, it's rich. It's got a lot of oak, but it's its the right kind of oak for my palate. I love it. I just wish you guys would produce more of it. <laughs> yeah. Do like two batches a year, you know? <laughs> you never know. I mean, we're always looking for, because I was saying earlier, you know, those barrels that age out and there's nowhere to put them, they just end up going to Four Roses Bourbon. And frankly, it's useless in there. You're never going to taste it. It's so diluted. Um, so we have found it's kind of unfortunate, but that it's because of disasters and stuff. But we had a we released one for the floods in Kentucky, you know, the 16 year old or 18 year old. We did two special releases. Then we had you know, some charity barrels that we let people auction or bid on. Uh, we had the visitor center opening, so we released those 20 year olds. Um, where it used to just be, you know, occasionally for Father's Day, we'd release one, or if we had a grand opening of the distillery, you know, once the expansion was complete. So we do it like every year or two, but I'm really trying to look for more occasions to sell those you know, five barrels, 10 barrels, 20 barrels that are just going to sit there and basically die on the vine if we don't use them for something else. So we've gotten a lot better about that in the last couple of years trying to find a vehicle because we don't do the limited edition single barrel anymore because the volume for that is we can't bear that that's too much we need to maintain those batches for small batch limited edition but we need to find a happy medium in there so there's some way to get some of these excellent batches out in front of people